My last guest for season one is Nidhi Gulati. She is a social impact executive and a human-centered design practitioner with eight years experience in the non-profit sector. She is committed to solve widespread social issues through the built environment and build bridges across the public, private and impact sectors. In this episode, we talked about her sensitivity towards gender, race and their manifestation in the built environment and her observations and lessons from Indian and the Western world. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I am Azban Sari, the founder of the organization Peacemakers Pakistani. And I'm bringing you the stories of placemakers, artists and professionals from around the globe about how they created an impact and made change happen. You are listening to the Making It Happen show. Thank you for joining in. Enjoy the episode. Um, hello Nidhi. Thank you for thank you so much for joining me today. How are you and how is it how is it in Paris? Hi Asa. I'm good. I'm good. Um Paris is very nice although it rains a lot in paris and i i like to explore cities i like to walk a lot and it feels like i mean walking in the rain is not my favorite thing and it feels like it takes away from my experience of really enjoying the city and also because of ongoing coronavirus uh paris shuts down at 6:00 we have a curfew here mm-hmm. on, on you know all outdoor activities so 6:00 the city begins to shut down so all the businesses grocery stores and everything shuts down which again if you think about it from like an exploring the city perspective and how a city works or doesn't work for women it's hard to know if you're not experiencing it in the evening like the sun is still out when the city begins to shut down so um it's mixed feelings but paris is still gorgeous yeah great okay let's start with the question answers without any delay okay so nidhi tell me what inspired you to be a public space advocate and a place maker so i am uh, born and raised indian as by you and i were just talking about that 25 years of my life i i lived in india and i feel like i spent a lot of my time even though i wasn't thinking about it i spent a lot of my time outside of the house simple places you know we the street in front of my parents house was where we played that's where we made friends um and then when i moved to to delhi to work i i walked a lot i liked exploring the markets a lot and it was just a lot of time intentionally or intentionally ended up spending in public spaces and also having access to public spaces good or bad was something that i started to take for granted i thought that all cities had public spaces and things that you could do um outside of your your house outside of the office that you had that And then I um moved to Texas in the United States uh, to study further. I went to st- get a master's in landscape architecture. And when I landed in in Houston, I don't I don't drive, I should say that here. When I landed in Houston, I felt like everybody who landed at the airport vanished before I got to the gate where I was going to take the bus to go to college station. And then when I got in the bus, I didn't see any people between you know leaving the airport and getting to college station where I was supposed to be living for the next 3 years. I didn't see any people. I saw a lot of cars, I saw highways, but I didn't see any kind of like bustling streets and public spaces and parks. I didn't automatically see them. And I started to question where these public spaces were. Like where were people? Where do you go so you run into other people? Where do you go see life? and i started to question how public spaces are designed where they are designed how do you get to public spaces and that just became part of the way i experienced my life that just became part of the way i lived my life um and i started to learn about planning and segmentation and car centered cities and it just drove me more and more towards public space access and public space activity should be a given it should be a granted everybody should have it because otherwise where do we all come together as a community as a people um and it was something that i was i was starting to miss a lot and you know all because i didn't drive and i didn't have the kind of access where you know you get in a car and you go to a plaza go to a park like you had to go to things you didn't discover them on your own you didn't 
it didn't occur to you. It just, you had to go looking for it. So that's what brought me to being curious about public spaces, because before that, I thought they just existed. They were just everywhere. And then I think that curiosity, curiosity turned into studying it more. I switched disciplines from landscape architecture to an environmental psychology based program in the Department of Recreation Parks and Tourism Sciences. So that was all about parks. But even then, I didn't focus on big national parks or, you know, other recreational areas. I focused more on the day-to-day parks. I focused more on urban parks and urban public spaces, which then brought me to to Project for Public Spaces and working on public spaces full time. Awesome. That's very interesting journey you had. And you learned a lot about yourself and also how the things work, right? Great. Yeah. Okay, so where are you from and where do you live now? And what differences have you experienced in these parts of the world? Uh, share your lessons or your insights. Right. So I have lived, as I said, 25 years of my life. I was living in India. And then I've lived in the United States in two different places. I lived in Texas, um, a, you know, a smaller city, college station in Texas, which is a university town. And then I moved to New York, which is where I lived for three and a half years. Then I moved to Boston for a year and a half. Then I came back to New York and stayed there for for quite a while. So ever since 2012, end of 2012, I think I left Texas and um, I've had a deep kind of permanent relationship with, with New York City. And now I am in France. I am going to business school in a small town called Fontainebleau. I'm going to INSEAD and that's where I'm living. And after this, I don't know. So these are some of the, the parts of the world that I've lived in. I, but I have a very strong relationship with New York and Boston. So, so that will still remain. Some of the differences that I've noticed, um, differences and similarities, actually. The thing about India was that in my town, I lived in a small town, Kalambala, which is north of, of Delhi in Haryana. The, the thing about Ambala was we didn't have a formal public space. You know, we used, to, we used to have a small park in our neighborhood, which later was turned into a municipal facility because there needed to be an um, underground well for fresh water supply. So that park became a municipal facility and was not a park anymore. So it was taken away. And after that, the places where we played was mostly our street. So my street was very important to me. That's where I met my friends. And it was a slower street. And things tend to be very informal. You know, we don't take rules very seriously on our streets in, in India. So it was the same street where you have cars and scooters and cycles, but very few was a residential street. And other times that was where we'll go stand out and I will play with my friends. So that's where my parents would go stand out and say hello to the neighbors. So that my street was my, my public space. And then I went to architecture school in Jaipur in Rajasthan because it's a bigger city was a little bit more planned. So some of the things were more kind of designed and regulated. So my university had a couple of public spaces and we had a recreation center and stuff like that. And that is where they were still in the middle of where, you know, between where I lived and between where my university, my university, my school, architecture school was, there were public spaces in between and you could like encounter them. So, and there were courtyards, which is a huge thing about Rajasthani architecture. There were courtyards where, kind of gathered or you know they'll be on the balconies and look look down um and then in every public space no matter what kind Jaipur has beautiful old bazaars and in every public space we have a lot of informal retail outside so like there's shops so there's a formal retail and there's a lot of informal retail outside of the shops where you know smaller vendors are selling their own things and it felt like there's always this two-way dialogue between the formal retail and the informal retail because they're both okay with each other. The shopkeepers know that there's a, there's a you know, stall keeper outside and the stall keeper knows that there's a fancier, bigger shop in front of them. And they're kind of, they negotiate space and they're kind of okay. And as a shopper, as a consumer, you're also kind of okay. You know, you like having the big shop, but you also like having the vendors. But there's like this constant unsaid dialogue that happens in every street and every market. And I feel like it becomes a part of you growing up. You learn how to negotiate space. You learn how to negotiate between different you know, prices and things that you're purchasing. And it becomes part of your experience. But I also think 
you know, you hear the sounds of the vendor and then you hear the sounds of the shop and you experience the place much more, you know, all your senses are engaged. And then there's food outside and informal vendors. So, you know, you smell the food and that's another sense that's engaged. So it's a very, um, you know, engaged experience being in a public space in India. And that's what I, what I felt, as you can imagine, like it was streets was where life happened for me. Like everything happened in the streets. But when I moved to the U.S., um, as I said, things were much more kind of regulated and designed. Um, so, you know, a park is a park and a shop is a shop. And there's not a ton of street retail. You're starting to see more food trucks and smaller vendors, but it's not, it's not the same. It's still very, very regulated. And if there are so many barriers to you starting your, your you know, starting to be a vendor on the street, if there's so many barriers, then people who have the ability and the resource to overcome that, those barriers become those vendors. So you start to see the same types of vendors who have maybe a central entrepreneur or a central owner who can get all of them their licenses. So it's a bigger entity that starts to have, you know, appearance as a vendor. Um, so it's very difficult to be just a, just the, the, you know, the little guy in that, in that market. So you don't see a lot of that. But because of the regulation, because of the fact that it's designed, sometimes you have, you'll have, you know, places to drink water, you'll have restrooms, you'll have clean toilets and other things, um, which make it nice that this is actually planned and regulated, that there's somebody who's going to clean the park, somebody who's going to clean the restroom, and that becomes the, the good part of it. So they're very, very different in that regard, that India was the organic bustling, every place outside of your, you know, outside of your door is a public space, whereas Things are much more kind of regulated um, in, in the U.S. But even within the U.S., I think cities like New York and Boston that are older cities have more public spaces, smaller you know, parks and pocket parks distributed everywhere. Whereas in the newer cities in Texas, that's not quite the case. There are bigger parks, but there are fewer of them. So you have to drive further to, to go to them. And if there's a park in your neighborhood, because the cities are so sprawling and not dense, there's not a lot of people in a park. So they're not, they're not overcrowded. They're not quite that bustling, the kind of public space that I'm used to. You don't see that in more, uh, more sprawling parts of, uh, more sprawling parts of the, the United States. And now I'm in France. So I'm experiencing this, which is very much like, you know, urban planning and ur urban planners study cities like Paris where, you know, all, all streets have some kind of retail and there are people walking everywhere because it's a walkable, denser city. And uh, there are kids everywhere with adults and there are older people. Everybody's kind of mixing, which is very, I mean, which is very much the case also in New York, but New York is again, one of the, the older um, cities. So those are some of the things that are different. What is similar is that I think even still, public spaces are designed usually for, people with more power and privilege, you know, like most of the planning books, architecture guides, famous buildings, um, urban planning manuals, they're all, they're all written by men and not just men, men who used to be powerful men, men who you were wealthier, had a voice, had, you know, presence. They were written by powerful men and for better or for worse, we're still following those manuals. We're still following those guidelines. And what we forget is that, as an environmental psychologist, we experience the city through a vehicle. That vehicle is our body. And the body is not the same for that powerful, the powerful men writing the guidelines and women and other gender minorities. Our entire vessel with which we experience our city is different. And unless we actively acknowledge that and try to welcome that vessel it's not going to just happen so most public spaces and cities are still around the world were and are still being designed by men and that is the biggest similarity i have noticed wherever i've gone that that is still the case and we need to we need to break that barrier both around like i said gender and around power like who had the voice and the capacity to write manuals for planning and why are we still following them? Because more than 50% of the world, actually vast majority of the world, 
does not fall into that ca category um, of people who wrote those manuals. So that's the similarity. Wow, it was so insightful. And it was, I guess we can have a complete debate over this, over this, what you have said, we can take it further. And awesome. Yes. And by the way, in Asia, I see that we have this spontaneity factor a lot. The whatever is happening in the in the streets and the crowd and everything, there's something happening in every every distance, little distance, and that's something that makes me happy. Basically, I feel joy in being in these spaces. Okay, so I read in your profile that you have decided to dedicate your career to the creation of urban systems that solve widespread social issues and advance environmental, social, and financial resilience of poor communities, especially youngest members. I highly appreciate that and thank you for being so considerate toward, uh, towards us. Tell me what are the widespread social issues that you have considered or discovered till now and you are working on? So I think we started getting into it a little bit already with, you know, what I said is the common thing with most cities and public spaces that I've seen. I think gender equity or the lack of gender equity is, is a huge thing for me that, I, um, that I'm working on. And I think it's a huge, huge issue, which affects different communities differently, but it's there, you know, that there's a difference along the lines of gender and gender identity in places. And um, a vast majority of our world's population has their needs have not been prioritized in our public spaces. And because we experience our built environment in the vessel, our body, as I said, if our body is not accounted for, that we're, then we're not 100% comfortable. Then we're not 100% thriving. We're not our thriving self. So imagine there's more than 50% of the world's population that hasn't reached its full potential in their cities and there's so much potential that we can lock if we could provide women and gender minorities comfortable and equitable environments to be in. So, so gender and gender identity and equity for that is a huge, huge issue that I would like to work on. And, um, and, and people, people always tell me that, you know, that the city is open to women and, you know, you can go any, anywhere you want. And a lot of the the shopping and vending and everything else in, in our cities is catered towards women. And I, and I hear that. I, am, I understand that. And I hear that. And being, being open and available to women is one thing. Being designed around the needs of women is a completely another thing. You know, most, yeah. most places that I've been to, I still don't feel very comfortable after dark if I'm alone. And, you know, I always watch my back and my bag and my belongings and all of that. And I, I have faced myself, you know, sexual harassment and other things in public spaces. If my comfort was a priority in how the city was designed and functioned, those things would not happen. And all people do not face that. So there is a difference. So I think what, what I usually try to say is like, there's, there's a gap between the level of access that, you know, some of our more privileged gender peers feel and where, where many women are. And in terms of us being equal, we first need to fill that gap. If we, you know, if, if one is here, one is here, and we give each, each of them equal weight, the gap would go down, up and down the same way. So we need to first plug the gap and then we can talk about equality. So it's really important to first, you know, plug that gap, which a lot of people um, don't quite understand unless they feel it themselves. So that's, that's a one, you know, one really, really, really big social issue that I would like to work on. And I think let's keep that gap in mind. The moment you layer on other social issues, that gap becomes bigger and bigger. Like let's think about gender minorities and, and women in, in poorer communities. So there's already access. And then if uh, access issues, and if there is then this issue of, you know, not having wealth, the disparities that come with wealth, that gap gets wider. And then if we think about vulnerabilities and, you know, challenges that you face because of your age, young girls 
that gap becomes wider. So the moment we lay on all these other issues, um, it becomes worse and worse and worse. So which is why if I have to focus my energy as an advocate, I keep in my mind, you know, that a, a young girl from a community that's marginalized, and that would be my priority audience that I want to work, work a lot on. And then there's this whole other area of issue and challenges of, of, you know, of climate change, which I think you can't ignore if you're working on the built environment space. You know, our, our cities and the way people and the things that we use travel has a massive footprint. Like we don't realize how much our transportation system and transporting goods costs our pl planet. So when we decide to have a, a fruit from a thousand kilometers away, or when we decide to wear a piece of clothing from 5,000 kilometers away, that has a huge carbon footprint. And that carbon footprint gets worse and worse when those things travel on the road instead of traveling on trains. It gets worse and worse when that thing travels on planes instead of trains. Like they all have different types of carbon footprint. And that is another huge social issue. It's not just an environmental issue. I think it's having impact socially because it's disrupting our communities. When climate begins to change and people change behavior and we have climate disasters, that affects the social fabric of our community as well. So that is a huge environmental and social problem and economic challenge that I think cannot be ignored if you are somebody who's working in the, in the built environment space. So I think my two biggest ones are climate change and the inequities that persist in our social environment, which includes the inequities of gender, race, and social economic status. Great. Yes, and we must work on these areas to bring more better changes. Okay, so how have you noticed the manifestation of gender and race issues in the built environment? So gender, we started to talk about a, a little bit. So, you know, like think about many of our, of our great cities and um, let's think about it from an angle of comfort. You know, so you go to a street, a shopping street, and you think about, are you comfortable here? And you start to notice little things like women who often tend to do more, um, you know, care responsibilities in a household. It's just, for better or for worse, that's still the case. Women do a lot more shopping and care um, activities in their households. Do we have streets and sidewalks where you can easily carry the things you're shopping? Oftentimes, sidewalks are designed in manual for like six feet for, you know, two people walking side by side and one person to pass and stuff like that. You see those guidelines. Does that six foot account for somebody carrying two shopping bags or somebody pushing a cart full of like, vegetables or, or other goods that you purchase. Oftentimes, no, that's not the case. Our, our manuals for design don't account for that. They account for like a grown adult walking in a normal tree. So there are little things like that. And if you think about if you're, there are women traveling with their children, traveling with elderly, how many places do you have where you can sit down and rest? Do we account for that kind of behavior in, in our city, in our shopping experience? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So can we, um, can we make that happen if, again, comfort for all people was indeed a priority? Do you see restrooms everywhere? And are those restrooms safe? You know, is there a lock on the inside and the outside so you feel like you're safe? But also places where you will not get trapped. Can somebody hear you? Like, do, do you have safe, efficient, and convenient facilities for, for people? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Same, same, always same criteria. Sometimes you have them. Most often you will not. So all those little things become a priority when you think about it from an equity and gender-based lens, and they show up in all sorts of cities. They are, they are everywhere. So this is more on the human scale level. Then let's think about one, one layer further out. If you are um, somebody who relies on public transportation and you're usually responsible for getting your kids to school and you're going to take the bus, is your bus station bus stop close to you? Is it walkable? Is that walkable distance safe? Or is there one street that you will have to cross, which is six lanes wide, and you're risking your life to cross that one street with a little, you know, your little person, your, uh, your child with a backpack, can you safely cross that street? 
Because if you can't, that one little thing will become a barrier to your accessibility. Um, and then if you are a woman walking alone at night, can you walk from the bus stop safely? Are there, are there lights if you, you know, if that makes you feel comfortable? Are there lights? Are there shops that might still be open? Are these shops that are run by women? Will that add to your comfort? Or are these shops where usually members of the other ten gender tend to be and you don't feel comfortable? So all of those things at the, at kind of that middle scale become very important. And then, at the third scale, the, the highest scale, let's zoom out. Let's look at the system and let's stay with the public transportation system. Let's stay with the bus system. ITGP is a international transportation um, advocacy organization. And they study a lot of behaviors and between you know, people. And they've also collected a lot of, lot of data around behaviors of different genders and gender identities. So what they've noticed is that women and other caregivers in the household tend to do what is called trip chaining. You know, you'll do a lot of short trips instead of doing big trips. So for example, if you're going to work in the morning, if you're somebody who works and you're going to work in the morning, you would probably drop your kid at school. You would probably get a cup of coffee or buy a few things that you need to do before you go to work. And then in the evening, when you leave work and you come back, you would probably pick up a few things for dinner. You will pick up the child from daycare. You do a few things before you go home. So this is called trip chaining. You do multiple trips. And these, these multiple trips in between, these links in the chain tend to be shorter in length. And they tend to be much more multimodal. Like you'll walk to one of those things. You might take a bus to another one of those things. And then you might cycle to another one of those things. Like they tend to be very multimodal. Whereas... Men, working men, oftentimes do very straightforward trips, like point A to point B. Leave home, go to work, go to work, you know, leave work, come home, like A to B, B to A. Now let's think about a lot of our public transportation system. Even the New York City subway system, they are designed to cater to that A to B kind of system where you leave work, you go home and back. Highway system, they're the same way. There'll be a highway inlet where you live. And then there'll be a highway exit where you work in, in the downtown in the United States, for example. And then you think about, oh, more than 50% of the population that does trip chaining is very inconvenienced in that environment because trip chaining is not easy in most cities. It is difficult to go from, from walking to bus to train. And sometimes you even have to pay multiple times by different tickets. So it's in little ways, it's actually disincentivized. It's harder for you to trip chain. And the system is not designed for that kind of thing. So you can see at different levels, it manifests differently. But it's, it's possible to change that if the people who were designing those systems were of all different gender identities. And not just their presence, but actually them having power. Them being comfortable enough to acknowledge and embrace that, yes, sometimes we have different needs. There are different things that make us comfortable. And those reasons are valid. Like those different needs are valid. So we can slowly start to fold them into our system. Yes. And you can conclude this in this question that what is meant by sustainable transportation to you? You can conclude it. Uh, sustainable transportation to me is transportation that is sustainable for the user and transportation that's sustainable for the planet. So for the user, I just talked about trip chaining, you know, um, if you have to take two, buy two different tickets to do your walking to bus to train, you already paid twice. And then if your bus stop was far from your train station that you had to take to go to work, then you spend more time in between and it's not convenient either. So chances are, when you start to earn more money and, you know, you want to overcome these barriers. So it's not sustainable to pay twice. It's not sustainable to be inconvenient. And you would not be doing the walking to bus to the train. It's just not going to be sustainable. So sustainable transportation, in my mind, is something that makes it easy and possible. So you would continue doing it even when you made more money. And even when you could purchase a car and drive, you would still do this because it was still safe, efficient, and convenient for you to do so. So that's on a human level. And I think on, on the planet level, we talked a little bit about this, but road-based transportation has more than four times the carbon footprint than, than trains. 
And walking has almost no footprints. You need no devices to, to walk. Yes, you need sidewalks and sidewalks have, have embedded carbon, but there are materials that you can utilize to make sidewalks more kind of carbon neutral. And the amount of space you need on a sidewalk is much smaller than the amount of space you need if you were driving on, on a road and in a car. So like the, the, the amount of material that you need is less and sustainable materials do exist. So let's start to think about what kind of patterns can we have for movement of not just people, but movement of the things that we consume that can be much more friendly to our environment. So it's sustainability on the level of the human and it's sustainability at the level of the, the planet. Um, and I think we can think about both of those in the context of a city. Like the city is the perfect laboratory where we can think about both of those levels and types of sustainability in our mobility infrastructure. As I forgot, there was another question you asked me right before that I didn't quite tackle. Uh, manifestation of um, differences in our built environment based on socioeconomic um, statuses and, and race and culture. I think all we have to do is sort of look at the history of segregation in any city, not just the United States, but in the United States, it has a name. It was called redlining. We can think about segregation in our cities and start to see how resources are given differently based on the different types of neighborhoods and who lives in those neighborhoods. And that's how it starts to show. I think the manifestation is very, very stark when you go from a majority black neighborhood in America to a majority white neighborhood in America, in any American city, even in New York, you can start to see those differences. I don't think I need to even point those out, but they're there. And they all have to do with, as I said, the level of representation that different people have had in our planning and design criteria, but also in actual positions of power, like who holds power, who makes decisions, are positions held equitably by people from different socioeconomic statuses and races, and you will start to see those differences. In India, you can see that difference between a formal design community and an informal community. And then you can see that the, the distribution of public goods, let's forget about the size of the house. Let's forget about can people afford fancier homes. Let's look at streets and public spaces and public infrastructure which should be given to us equally, but it's not, depending on whose neighborhood it is. Are those people considered equal citizens of the community? And if they're not, then what they get is also not equal. And it's everywhere, not a single place I've visited where that difference doesn't exist on the lines of socioeconomic status and, and culture and race. Right. Okay, so Nidhi, have you explored the topic of women in the city in the light of patriarchy? Um, I think that's, that's all I do. That's, that's really all I do. You know, when I'm talking about power and who holds power and who has a voice, it's, it's all about, you know, patriarchy. Sometimes it's, it's visible. I mean, I come from a patriarchal culture. It's very visible there. But oftentimes we'll say that more kind of Western and, and more progressive cultures, it's, it's still there in, in the United States. Because if you look at, in New York, you know, you look at our city council and how many women on the city council, and you get to see it's nowhere near 50%. It's nowhere near 50%. Um, so it's still in subtle ways that the voice of one gender being heard over another is very, very prominent. And by the way, I'm in mean, New York City population, there are more women than men. So the, the constituents are more of one gender. And this is not even accounting for gender minorities, then you will have definitely have more than 50% in almost most, you know, any city. And in positions of power, people who are actually making decisions at the end of the day about how money is spent, how money is allocated, that doesn't tend to be women. So in little, um, in little ways and big ways, patriarchy persists almost everywhere. And I think the first step in sort of moving past that is acknowledging that that exists and that the existence is causes a problem because then, as I said, the voices of the people who are not represented don't get represented either. Um, and it's, we can, we definitely need allies in, in men, obviously, we definitely need that, but we also just, we need representation and that exists everywhere as well. So I think in the work that I do, I talk about it very prominently. I talk about, now I'm in business school. Similarly, I talk about, you know, women in business 
how many women get to be CEOs, how many women get to be director of boards, how many women, women get to be on board of directors at all, you know, and many, many, many businesses, you'll see that that's nowhere near equal. And it's just around the country, around the con- country, my country, my adoptive country and around the world, it continues to be an, an ongoing, ongoing issue. I forget who, who said this, it's like the, the greatest untapped resource in the world is the, is the talent and, um, you know, contribution of women. And that is so very true because we're, when we are in the workforce and when we're fighting for our rights, we're doing exactly that. We're fighting, we're working harder because the system is not designed to prioritize our success and the headwinds that we're running against are stronger. So we have to work extra hard and we can't expect people to continue to work extra hard. It's it's exhausting. So we have to create a system where the level of effort that we put into our success is somewhere near equal. Yes, I totally agree. Yes, I'm facing that myself so I can relate to it and I, I advocate for it myself. Okay, so the question that I really wanted to hear you answer is that the joke that women are bad drivers. That's a deep star we all have. Shed some light on that. So I think one of the things we already talked about a little bit, um, when we design our streets, when we design our cities, who wrote those manuals? And let's now think about the A to B trip that you know, men tend to do, working men tend to do. You're going from point A to point B. So your journey is one kind of journey. You're, you, you got in your car, you got on your scooter, or you got on the, on the train, and you're going from point A to point B. You know, it's, it's just two destinations. It's less things to think about. Now, if it's me and I'm traveling, I'm thinking about, oh, I have to drop my laundry. I need to, get, I need to pick up lunch. I need to pick up stuff for dinner. And, um, oh, we ran out of soap. I need to pick up soap. And, like, little things that are going on in my mind which means that there are multiple destinations in the same brain. And I need to process that while I'm thinking about my trip. So sometimes that would mean that I would stop more often than somebody who's doing a point A and point B, because obviously I'm trip training, I'm stopping more often. So that's one thing. The other is, and this I actually found out only two years ago about um, our, you know, the cars and, and all of that. So I'm not, I'm not sure if, if you know, or, or, or our listeners would know, most car manufacturing companies um, have very sophisticated systems to design for safety. You know, how do you, the airbags and when there's an impact, how does, how does your, your car and the infrastructure protect your, your body? Um, and what you will realize is that most car companies you'll ama- use a male dummy to design their entire safety infrastructure, which is very complicated infrastructure, you know, very, um, it's very sophisticated and they use a male dummy. And now let's think about what I talked about earlier, the vessel through which you're experiencing that space and that, that, that automobile is different. What makes a male body vulnerable is not what makes a woman's body vulnerable. And the entire safety infrastructure inside a car is not even designed to protect women. So when there's a collision, the impact on women's body is different. And you can see that in the number of women who end up in hospital with serious injuries after crashes. It's way, way, way higher because again, the airbags and the safety infrastructure is not designed to protect our body. Um, Writer Carolyn Corolla, um, Carolyn Credo Perez, my apologies, has written an entire book about this. It's called Invisible Women and it's about data bias in our environment. And built environment is one of the things she talks about, especially she talks about transportation and, and cars. Um, and it's definitely that book. It's very, very important in my mind. But aside from the safety infrastructure, you know, oftentimes we know that women have shorter torsos than men. But if you don't design for that, you know, women have to pull up their car, uh, the, the seat to get ahead so you can see over the steering wheel and you can drive. So this is another place where, you know, you have to readjust the entire mechanism to be comfortable as a driver. And unless it's designed in a way that women's bodies can be equally comfortable inside a car. It's not going to be the case. So we often joke about that as well, right? Like men get in a car and they would joke sometimes about, oh, my sister or my, my, my girlfriend or my wife or my mother or my whoever must have ridden this. That's why the seat is so high up. Like people joke about that all the time. 
it's not a show. That's, that's what, what wasn't designed, you know, and we all joke about it. Um, but it's like little things that we don't often, often think about that that entire vessel is not designed to prioritize the comfort of women. And there are more than 50% of the drivers in the United States, the, the driving country, more than 50% of the drivers are women. So more than 50% of the customers of those cars are women and they're not designed for, for women. So that's like just a huge um, difference there. And it's, yeah, it's, I have joked about women being bad drivers. Don't get me wrong. We all do that. We fall into those traps and biases. But until you look deeper, you realize, oh, like we could literally, we're more likely to die in a crash because it was like not designed for, for our needs. And highway designers have been historically and still continue to be all men. The writers of transportation planning and engineering, it is a very male dominated field. And as I said, at least again, looking at data in the United States, more than 50% of the customers of those highways are women. And their needs are not accounted for. And they're not the designers. They're not the decision makers. And then we, we, just, we just don't have the right to joke that they're bad drivers. We did not design our infrastructure to make them comfortable and to allow them to be good drivers. It's not, it's not that simple. Nothing is that simple. Yes, I, I really I agree with that. And also that the, the first point that you mentioned that we have a lot going on in our minds. That, that plays a very huge role in this as well. Okay, so what are the benefits you have noticed so far through practicing the agenda of diversity, inclusion, and equity? How has it helped you in your career's vision of supporting the youngsters? The climate change? Um, I think I will say that it has kind of, it has been the fuel that powers my career. It has, it is the fuel that gets me going in the morning. Um, but it has not been easy by any means like it's not I can't really say that it's supported because um to be very honest these are these are tough topics to talk about um, and um it is hard to kind of fight the power battle um but I think that it's incredibly important and it's incredibly gratifying because if we don't think about the needs of a majority of our world's population and don't think about them being comfortable, then they are not thriving to the extent that they could. Then they're not participating in everyday life to the extent that they could. Then they're always either uncomfortable participating in the economy or when they are participating, they're not participating to their fullest. So I think there's a huge economic argument to be made around diversity and inclusion because there are lots of people who have untapped potential that our systems are not allowing to be met. So there's that, that argument. And if people were more comfortable participating in the economy, were more particip participating in their city, um, then they would just be thriving at a different level. And there's a huge argument to be made, made around that. The other is, I think it is just simply the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do to think about people and their access and people who don't have access to get them access. It's just our, it's our responsibility. It's our duty to think about that because we should be thinking about a more equal world. We should be thinking about a time where our, our lived experiences, our cultural and racial nuances are our strengths, are our powers. It's not something that we're trying to hide. It's not something that we're trying to run away from because when we do that, we get in a very kind of competitive cutthroat individualistic mentality which is not what we need to combat big social challenges and environmental challenges like climate change we need to come together for that we need to become a collective for that and in order to do that we have to make everybody feel like a part of the same community and currently we don't so in order to practice a collective mentality we need to become collective people we need to become collective communities because the challenge is that we're all facing to different extents, but that we're all facing are too huge for us to try to tackle them individually. They need our collective muscle. Yes. Uh, you say that what we need is villages in our cities. That's how you conclude your advocacy for inclusive cities. Elaborate this a bit, how you came to this conclusion. Yes. So I think the villages in our cities were um, something that became very, very, very prominent in the time of COVID. You know, around the world, people were not 
traveling like they used to because offices shut down, schools shut down, colleges shut down. So we were doing our our jobs and our education and everything else from our homes. We had to, we had to isolate, we had to stop the spread of this pandemic. And what that did was it really reduced our, our life and the footprint of our life to our home and our neighborhood around it. And that for a lot of people showed that, you know, we can actually live a smaller footprint. We don't necessarily need to live a bigger, bigger footprint, um, but not everybody had the ability to do that. People who are essential workers and were traveling to go to their essential jobs didn't have the, the, the privilege to shorten their footprint. And people who lived in sort of resource-starved neighborhoods where your grocery store, your school, your everything else is not around you in 10 minutes didn't have the ability to do that either. So some people didn't and some people didn't. But it showed you that this is something that is possible, that can be done. And what it does is it really shortens our footprint to a smaller area, which is your, your house and your neighborhood. And by doing that, you can actually shorten the environmental footprint of your life as well, which is really what we need to stop future pandemics, which is really what we need to, you know, get a hand on climate change. And it would only happen if we thought about our life and our city at that level of a village where everything that we needed was in 10, 15 minutes of us. And there's a huge movement around, you know, the 15 minute city and the 20 minute city that you can find. Um, and it's, it can be found online. There's a lot of literature about it. And that's really what it's talking about. How do we sort of shrink our lifestyle to fit a village? Because it's possible. That's how we used to live. That's how older, you know, settlements used to be. They were much smaller. And in addition, I think something from a placemaking perspective people feeling a sense of belonging with their neighborhood, sense of belonging with their neighbors and their people, your footprint has to be something that you can wrap your head around where you know the people, you run into similar people, where you know the person who owns your grocery store and you know the person who runs the school and all these other things. You need to be able to wrap your head around that and that cannot happen at the scale of bigger cities. Those can be sprawling cities like Houston, those can be denser cities like New York, but that scale is too big. And even in, in New York, I was traveling 45 minutes to go to work. And I enjoyed the train ride because that's where I read my book and everything else. But I was always 45 minutes away from where I lived. I was always 45 minutes away from my neighborhood, which in other aspects had everything else. Like I was privileged to have in my neighborhood everything else that I needed. Doctors, grocery stores, caregivers, markets, everything else that I needed was in my neighborhood. But my job was not there. So I couldn't live that village lifestyle but I know that it is possible. That's how we used to live. And it is something that can tackle both of those sustainability issues that we talk about, the um, sustainable, sustainable mobility for the human being and sustainable mobility for the planet if we actually reduce our footprint. So the, the people movement would be one, but then we would start to consume the products and things at a smaller footprint too. So our goods will not have to travel as much. Yes. Okay, so in this last question, you have you can just summarize whatever you have learned so far. Uh, what are your key findings till now about the fact that a built environment has a substantial and sustained impact on a personal and social lives? So, as an environmental psychologist, I studied this a lot. My the the environmental psychology, the field is all about the impact of the environment around you on on you, the human, and then the human's impact back on the environment around them. There's a very strong relationship. We tend to behave according to the spaces that we're in. You know, so if you live in a small house, you tend to live a smaller life. You know, you have smaller, smaller couch, smaller bed, smaller everything. You live in a big house, you spread out, you get a bigger sofa, bigger couch, bigger bed, bigger everything. So we get accustomed to the space that we're given. And similarly, depending on the kind of behavior that you want to have, you shape the built environment. And that's what people have done all along. Um, so there's this really strong interrelationship between the consumer and the environment around them. And it continues to have an impact over time. So like take the example of a car. When we start to design a city around the size of a vehicle and the vehicle gets keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we continue to transform our environment to fit that thing, to fit that vessel. And then our city continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The house gets bigger. The, the garage get big, gets bigger. The road gets bigger. The grocery store gets bigger. Like everything still gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So it continues to have that impact. And then it continues to change our habits. We get used to that. 
So there's a very strong relationship between how we live, what we consume, um, and the environment that's around us. So because it's so strong, because it's so impactful, we cannot ignore it. So we had to chip away at it little by little. Um, and what I've learned is that you need at least three levels of change. We can't just expect people to change their habits. That's, that's not what, it ha what, what it's about. There are three levels to making change happen. The change at the top, at the policy level, at the, at the level of the system that we talked about, um, the entire transportation system, the entire public, transporta uh, public transportation system. At the level of the system, we need to have change. And we need to design systems that are more sustainable, that can support a sustainable life. So that's one level. The second level is, is the level of the practitioner. That's where a lot of the placemakers, planners, architects live. Like people who are actually looking at the policy, looking at the planning manuals, and translating them for everyday use, translating them into an actual environment. That level, the practitioner level, needs to be on board with change as well. And then at the human scale, the everyday life scale, we need people to start to practice more sustainable habits, start to practice empathy and equity, and then we can see change. So like all three levels, it needs to happen. And that is the only way we're going to drive change. It's not just about telling somebody, oh, stop driving. No, they drive because they have to. They, they get the fruit that's traveling to them from like 5,000 miles away because they have to. They don't have a choice. So it's not about just the human changing their habit. It's about at all three levels. We need to systematically um, drive equity. We need to systematically drive sustainability. Awesome. Okay, so now we are having our wrap-up questions that I ask everyone. You can answer them in one line to just get it done. Okay, so what drives you? What keeps you focused on public spaces? I think public spaces is where all of the city's systems come together. This is where you see the public space system, the housing system, public transportation system, education system, commercial system, everything comes together. And I think that togetherness of it, like this is where everything comes together is what gets me really excited about public spaces. And the second is, as I said, this is supposed to be our shared resource. And we can only think about shared resources as a community, as a, as a shared identity, as a shared people. And that really gets me excited. It's something that we're all supposed to have access um, equally, but we usually don't. Great. Okay. So what was your proudest moment of work life? Proudest moment. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm quite that proud of myself yet. But one moment that was really energizing was right before I started business school, I gave a keynote speech um, at a transportation conference in, in Portugal. It was called Mobi 2020. And I talked about women and transportation. That was a very, very empowering moment. And I will cherish that forever. Great. And what was your hardest moment of work life? I don't have one. I think being an advocate is a difficult job. And I know a lot of people do it. I'm not alone. But it hasn't stopped me yet. So it, nothing has been the hardest. I've been able to overcome it. Great. So none yet. Very good. <laughs> okay, share your favorite place making mantra or whatever you follow. Your tagline. My tagline is that it's all about access and power. And it's not equal. Okay. And your, share your opinion about Pakistan or place making in Pakistan. I see Pakistan as a sister country I always have, uh, a sister culture and a sister community. And I think the mantra for placemaking in Pakistan should be value the organic and informal infrastructure in our public spaces. Because once it goes away, once we sanitize and clean the informal, it's not easy to bring it back. It's our greatest strength is how our public spaces are organic. Yes. Thank you so much. And lastly, any message for global leaders out there as many young professionals are joining in? I would say go to Pakistan and enjoy the street like I described. See, see the informal 
infrastructure, see the organic entrepreneurial spirit of public spaces in Pakistan, and see how all of your senses are engaged when you're in a public space, and you'll be better for it. Yeah, and similar in all other Asian countries as well. Absolutely. Every country has that. Some of our oldest cultures in the world definitely have more, you know, that more elevated. Yeah. And I think it's something that needs to be experienced on one's own. Yes. Thank you so much, Nidhi. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. I wish I could have learned more from you, but I'm looking forward to learning from you more in the future. Take care Absolutely. and explore Paris as much as you can. <laughs> Live your Thank life. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will send you photos. I will send you photos. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.